This video shows you how to use a circular saw, how to select your blade and the dust extraction, as well as health and safety tips and how to make diagonal cuts on plywood. And here, the power tool that we've got is the Guild 1400 watts, 185mm circular saw. The table saw is at the very core or epicenter of the woodworking shop. And at the very core of your table saw is your blade selection. Suffice to say, the blade selection is crucial or pertinent with regards to getting quality cuts. And so the big question is, why have we opted for a circular saw? You know, firstly, a circular saw is handheld, whereas, you know, a table saw is stationary, you know, it lays flat. The, you know, circular saw is budget friendly. The table saw is slightly more expensive. You can make fewer cuts when using the circular saw, but with the table saw, you can make more accurate cuts. You know, it's quite messy uh, when you're using, you know, the circular saw, you know, with sawdust, but, you know, the um, table saw tends to be a lot more cleaner. If blade selection is pertinent or at the very core of getting quality cuts, then we must be able to decipher or interpret technical data that is associated with the cotton blade. Technical data or jargon isn't as daunting as it seems once you get the hang of it. For the Guild power tool, we've got a blade size of 185mm, a blade bore at 20mm, it's got a cutting capacity of 90 degrees at 65mm and 45 degrees at 45mm, so it essentially means you know it can cut at various angles up to a depth of 65mm or 45mm depending on um, the angle. And also a bevel capacity that's capable of doing cuts, you know, from anywhere between 0 to 45 degrees. So it could be 0, 15, you know, 30 and 45 degree cuts, okay? At a later stage, I will be showing you how to set, you know, the depth that you want to cut and the angle at which you want to cut, okay? But first, let's get conversant with all of this data. If you juxtapose the technical data information side by side with the information that you've actually got on your blade, we can instantly begin to see that there is a correlation. 185 being the actual blade size or the size of the rim. 20 mil being the blade bore, which is right at the center of the blade. And 2.4 millimeter is the thickness or kef of the blade. At a later stage, I will show you how to adjust your cutting and bevel capacity. The next step would be to familiarize with other work tool components. When I push on the lower guard lever clockwise through the fixed guard, it reveals the bottom of the blade. And you can see that it has been rotated in the direction of both arrows earlier highlighted in the aforementioned. To change your saw blade, you need to take out the blade bolt and the outer flange with an Allen key, which then reveals the blade bore, the saw blade and an inner flange behind it. Just remember that when fitting in a new blade, that the saw blade must be sat on the inner flange, okay? Suffice to say, the saw blade must be sandwiched between the inner and outer flange, you know, with the blade bolt coupled onto the outer flange, okay? The tip of one tooth to the tip of the next tooth is called the step, while the gullet is the space in front of each tooth. Just take cognizance of the gullet, you know, the size and its depth determines how much wood can be removed during cutting. In general, if a saw blade has fewer teeth, the speed rate will be faster and it will have a larger gullet size. And larger gullet sizes are most suited to ripping applications. But if you've got more teeth and smaller gullet sizes, then it's more suited to cross-cut applications. I'll show you what I mean in a minute, okay? Economy blades almost always have a thin stamped steel plate with expansion slots that end bluntly in open holes, which is what we've got here. The open hole exudes or signals old technology, you know, and, and a noisy blade. You know, it's got a 2.4 kef, a 20 mil center bore, and a 1 to 5 mil rim size. 
And so this is the center bore. You undo it with an Allen key if you want to change the blade. Okay, so again, that's your rim size at 185. Your center bore is at 20 mil and your kef is at 2.4. Is this blade has got 24 teeth. And it's got large gullet sizes between the teeth, which means that, you know, it can be used to move out, you know, big chunks of wood. 24 teeth typically connotes a ripping blade. And you can see on the blade, it's highlighted that this blade is designated for cotton wood. You also have to wear your ear protection or muffins, your face mask, you know, um, eye protection or safety glasses. You know, just pretty much take health and safety precautions and ensure that you read the instruction manual. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health recommends that hearing protection must be worn when operating tools with a sound pressure level above 85 dBA or decibels noise level. And you can tell this is going to be a noisy blade because it adopts the open technology, you know, here. The long-term goal of NIOSH is to reduce the noise-induced hearing loss in occupational settings. And so, if you want to choose a quiet blade and the appropriate hearing protection, um, you can check the NIOSH um, database for recommended sound power levels in terms of vibration of the work tool, as well as the sound power levels for the loaded and unloaded conditions of the work tool to choose the appropriate hearing protection and to estimate the noise exposure. The blade installed has got a small teeth and the tooth configuration is an alternate top bevel. The stamped blade doesn't categorically state the hook or rake angle, neither does it state the bevel angle. But we can assume that the alternate top bevel angle is anywhere between 10 to 20 degrees typical. And that's because an alternate top bevel, which is used for all purpose ripping and cross cutting, typically has, you know, a bevel angle of anywhere between 10 to 20 degrees typical. The cap for each tooth is about 2.4 mil in thickness. And here you can see that the blade, which is usually protected by the lower blade guard, extends below the base plate. And you can see that the blade has got large gullet sizes between each tooth. You know, the ATB or the alternate top bevel is suited for ripping. The, the 24 teeth is suited for ripping, but it essentially isn't suited for cutting strips from hard plywood. So we can see that this ripping blade has got a positive um, rake angle of anywhere between 0 to 20 degrees. And that's because you can see the inclination of the teeth or tooth. You can also use you know, a flat top grind, an alternate top bevel or a TCG um, configuration for rip blades. But you know, for hard plywood, you will be better off you know, getting you know, a combination blade or a composite um, blade. And that's because the grain structure on your hard plywood is not uniform, it's, it's haphazard. And so, you know, your composite blades or your combination or general purpose blade will do a pretty good job of ripping and cross cutting at the same time. So what quality of cut can we expect if we proceed to utilize this ripping blade um, to cut strips from um, the hard plywood, you know, I'd be expecting, you know, a somewhat poor quality cut, you know, with excessive tear out in, in certain places. I would also be expecting overheating, okay? So I would be using it to get the job done, but not overly extensively, as I do not want to compromise um, on the integrity of the blade. I would try as much as possible to keep my hands steady, you know, whilst um, cutting strips off of the um, hard plywood. And I will also be adding 3mm to the depth of my cut so that the blade can cut through the hardwood plywood material at the base here. And with the open technology, you know, around the rim of the blade, as exemplified at the base um, here, you should be expecting a very noisy operation of the work tool, okay? As this is not a quality blade, it is an economy blade. 
So just a quick recap, when you're trying to get quality cuts, the blade selection as well as the type of material that you want to cut is very important. Here we intend to get strips off of hard plywood and so you know the ripping blade with latch gullets, you know, or the open hole technology isn't the ideal blade, you know, for getting strips off of hard plywood. You should be getting a tooth configuration, you know, that's got the ATB, which is the alternate top bevel, as well as a combination composite or general purpose blade due to the grain structure of the hard plywood. In a subsequent video, I will be showing you how to use the power rail guide for cutting, you know, shit goods, you know, to save time, energy and material waste, you know, pretty much making repetitive cuts. Here, we've got a vacuum adapter that installs into the vacuum hose. Here, them two screws secures the vacuum adapter onto the circular saw's fixed guard. You can use the vacuum adapter without installing the vacuum hose. You know, that's pretty much an option, but just, you know, take cognizance that um, your work area will be very messy. So you might want to modify the vacuum adapter with a wood extraction adapter, which I will be showing you in a minute. So here we've got two G clamps, you know, one's got a capacity of 75 mil and the other has got a capacity of 100 mil, which is the thickness that it can clamp. The 75mm G clamp has got a throat depth of 50mm and the 100mm G clamp has got a throat depth of 60mm which is how further in the hardwood plywood and um, board can, you know, can go in. To ensure that there isn't play when we're stripping the hardwood plywood, we will be using two clamps to secure and prevent play or movement when we're stripping the hardwood plywood. And so now, in order to prevent wood or sawdust, um, detritus, and you know wood chippings from messing up the work area, we can limit the impact of wood dust, um, which can be carcinogenic, from further compounding respiratory issues by wearing our safety face mask and using a universal coupling to extract majority of the debris emanating from the circular sore. At the very core level, them two couplings are the same with respect to the design, but vary dimensionally in the diameter. So the WF08 universal coupling, which is the green in the green paper back here, um, varies more in diameter. It's a size 40 mil, whereas the WF07 is a size 32 mil. So you know, depending on whatever coupling fits your um, vacuum adapter you can install it okay them couplings are universal they're used in vanity wash basins sinks wash machines vertical pipes and horizontal pipes so we've just pretty much adapted this to the vacuum adapter for the circular so and it works um, perfectly fine you know might you might still have you know some sort of wood dust escaping or chippings but you know majority of the um, debris emanating from the um, circular saw is captured okay so here we've got the W08 40 mil coupling and here we've got the W07 32 mil coupling with a tolerance of anywhere between 30 to 38 mil and you would usually find this on one quarter inch vanity wash basins. The 40 mil coupling has a tolerance level of anywhere between 38 to 48 mil. And this 40 mil or one and a half inch coupling are usually found in sinks, washing machines, dishwashers, showers and baths, okay? And since both couplings are versatile, we can adapt them, you know, to the vacuum adapter for, for the circular saw. On visual inspection, the vacuum adapter fits the 40 mil and 32 mil couplings. You know, we just need to talk tight in afterwards. So here I am installing the solid non-flexible um, hose bit into one end of the coupling. The only risk associated with installing the non-flexible um, bit into one end of the coupling is that, you know, when you're moving the secular saw, um, it could break, you know, the vacuum adapter. And that's because the non-flexible um, bit of the vacuum hose is static. And so that could easily yank or break the vacuum adapter, which is moderately sturdy. 
you can see a tiny little gap between the coupling and the non-flexible and black hose. And so we top tighten it clockwise a little bit more to close that gap and so that we've got a firm connection and there, you know, is no debris, you know, escaping when we're extracting, you know, the wood dust. And on visual inspection on the inside of the coupling, you know, there isn't any gap, you know, between the coupling and the um, not flexible hose. So I will install the vacuum adapter on the other end, you know, top tighten it to make sure that I've also got a firm connection on the other side. I prefer, you know, to install the hose, the coupling and the vacuum adapter outside of the circular saw to avert or reduce incidences of, you know, breaking the vacuum adapter when torque tightening. That extra bit of, you know, torque tightening the knot, you know, when pulling on the trigger, you know, on the drill could um, snap the um, vacuum adapter. So the last step for me usually would be to, you know, screw in, you know, the vacuum adapter onto the circular saw after, you know, top tightening, you know, the hose and the vacuum adapter to the coupling. And also to reduce the risk of, you know, breaking the vacuum adapter, I will remove the non-flexible um, hose and just fit in, you know, the flexible, flexible part of the hose onto the coupling. So get your flathead screwdriver into the notch there and, you know, remove that clip, you know, from one end and the other clip and that, you know, leaves you with, you know, the flexible part of the hose only. So I've kind of, kind of like push fit that into the, um, the coupling and, you know, if I can't get it into the diameter of the coupling, I would undo it, you know, the, the screw so that, you know, I get more room there and then push fit the um, vacuum into the hole. Okay. And if you're not able to push fit, you know, the flexible hose into the coupling, you know, loosen the knot, undo the knot anti-clockwise, you know, step by step. You can see it's got steps in there. So you would be hearing the clicking sound as it undoes each step. OK, you know, when you've got more room, push fit the um, flexible hose into one end of the coupling. OK, then top tighten it you know, to prevent, you know, debris from escaping, you know, through any apertures. And you can see that the 32 mil coupling provides, you know, a tight fit for the flexible hose and the vacuum adapter on the, on the other end. With the arrow on the drill facing down, we're going to top tighten, you know, the knot, you know, to ensure that we've got, you know, a really tight connection between the coupling, the flexible hose and the vacuum adapter. And if we compare, you know, the non flexible hose against the flexible hose, we can easily see upon visual inspection that the flexible hose provides more room for flexibility when installed into the coupling. It's pretty much pretty common sense. So at this stage, we're going to undo the knots, you know, and replicate the process for the 40 mil coupling. But also take note that when you're undoing the knot, you know, on the step clip, you might, you sometimes might um, undo the step clip to its full limit. So I will show you how to reset or set up the step clip to regain its full functionality. If you attempt to insert the step clip back into its um, aperture, um, it wouldn't regain functionality. The best way to do it is just to set, you know, the step clip first into position, then start top tightening it back so that, you know, it latches onto the teeth of the step clip incrementally as you top tighten. And so basically when the arrow on the drill faces down, we're top tightening and when the arrow faces up, we're top loosening. Okay. And here you can see that the clip teeth have started latching onto the other mating pad from the other end. So when next your clip teeth falls out of position, don't discard it. This is the way to fix it, okay? Don't try to push it in. Set it up into position, then top tighten gradually, okay? And your um, clip teeth should come back to full functionality. So here we're replicating the process for the 40 mil coupling and you can see, you know, the force of the drill yanking the coupling and the flexible hose away and that's what we're trying to prevent. Ideally, you don't want to be top tightening, you know, when the vacuum adapter is, you know, already installed, you know, on the um, circular saw working tool. You want to, you know, be top tightening, 
you know, the coupling, the flexible hose and the vacuum adapter away from the circular saw. You know, installing the vacuum adapter should be the last thing that you do um, when you're trying to, um, you know, connect um, your hose. If your vacuum adapter connection and your flexible hose is loose, talk tightening, talk tightening further. But, you know, always visually inspect and, you know, test, you know, the um, firmness of the connection by, you know, pulling out or pushing out, you know, the flexible hose and the vacuum adapter just to make sure that you've got a sturdy and tight fit connection, okay? But, you know, pull on the trigger, you know, of the drill gradually and not with um, maximum um, force. And as you can see here, we've got a very sturdy connection. So the 32 mil coupling works perfectly um, for my vacuum, which is the Henry vacuum. And the 40 mil um, coupling also works as well. So it's pretty much up to you, whatever is your choice, test them out and see what works for you, okay? So here, I haven't got a piece of rigid film insulation, neither have I got, you know, planks that I could stack on the floor to make diagonal cuts um, through the hardwood, plywood and board sheet. So, I would be improvising using this rack here. You really don't need to do this, as you could employ the use of a table saw and a ripping fence, you know, to make diagonal cuts, you know, but I haven't got access to that at the moment. And, you know, making diagonal cuts can be quite tricky, okay? So, I would be using this rack in place of my workbench or my table saw. Do not try this if you do not know what you're doing, okay? But, you know, resort to using your workbench or your table saw um, to, you know, cut diagonal cuts from your hardwood plywood. But I'd use this, you know, because I'm quite confident, you know, that I'd be able to pull through. It's freezing and cold outside, so I couldn't stack up planks, you know, to place the board sheet on top to provide clearance for the circular saw's blade. Don't have access to a table saw at the property, you know, and even if I decided to use a traditional um, workbench, I may be able to strip off weed on, you know, on the side of the workbench, but not to cut diagonal cuts, you know, from the hardwood plywood. So and that's where, you know, this rack comes in handy for myself, okay? The two circular poles or bars at the very top of the rack would be where the hardwood plywood board rests. The two circular bars or poles are quite ductile and malleable, so I would be clamping on the board, you know, using my two G clamps to secure the board onto them two circular bars or poles at the very top of the um, rack. So the poles are quite rigid, they are firm and, you know, sort of like just gives just about the right tension that you need to secure the board onto them poles. Suffice to say, it's not just like a rounded grip with them G clamps, you know, at the poles, you know, it's sort of like, you know, a flattened out, um, you know, grip, slightly flattened out grip, you know, with them G clamps um, when securing the board onto them poles, okay? You know, a slightly flattened out grip just about where the fixed jaw and the movable jaw, you know, intersects with the board and the pole, okay, or the board sheet. Here, we're going to use a size 8 socket bit to fasten the mechanical fastener on the coupling. You know, we're going to attach the um, vacuum adapter dust extraction bit onto the circular saw working tool. And once we've inserted the socket bit size 8 into the chuck of the drill, we fasten the mechanical fastener, you know, on the step clip you know, onto the coupling, you know, it doesn't matter. You could use um, whatever size coupling as long as it fits your vacuum adapter as previously highlighted, okay? As previously highlighted, you know, the vacuum adapter goes to one end of the coupling and the hose goes into the other end. You know, adjust, you know, the mechanical fastener appropriately, you know, until you get, you know, a tight fit, you know, on the vacuum adapter. Once the hose and the vacuum adapter have been adequately secured onto the coupling, then you install the vacuum adapter with two screws onto the circular saw, just like I've, I've done here, onto the fixed guard. So we have fastened the vacuum adapter onto the dust extraction outlet, onto the latches, onto the fixed guard with two screws. And prior to this, connect it directly a suitable vacuum hose to the adapter. 
the bevel capacity of the second last saw is anywhere between 0 to 45 degrees and to use this we need to turn the base plate bevel lock in an anticlockwise direction to losing the angle scale the base plate angle scale reads anywhere between 0 to 45 degrees tilt the base plate away from the tool until the required cutting angle is adjusted on the angle scale and then subsequently tighten the bevel lock by turning it in a clockwise direction do not use the depth of cut scale when making bevel cuts due to the possible inaccuracy here the bevel cut is set at 45 degrees and you can see that the base plate is tilted away from the tool Suffice to say, the bevel cut capacity is anywhere between 0 to 45 degrees. You know, you can cut 0 degrees, 15 degrees, 30 degrees and 45 degrees on, on the bevel, okay? So basically just undo the bevel lock anticlockwise, you know, toggle through the angles that, you know, uh, meets your bespoke requirements. Then, you know, to turn the um, bevel lock clockwise to secure or confirm the angle that you want to you know cut through and for the depth of cut if we lift the lower guard lever to reveal the lower blade guard it reveals the blade and when we visually inspect the blade we can see that the blade is too far out you know from the base plate and that's because we do not need all of that, you know, blade protruding from the base plate if we're just cutting, you know, a hardwood plywood of about 12 mil. And here you can see that, you know, the blade protrudes from the base plate. So the depth of cut is definitely greater than 12 mil, which is the hardwood plywood's um, thickness that we want to cut through. To reduce the depth of cut to 12 mil or 15 mil, we lift the depth of cut lock lever and raise the saw body away from the base plate and straight away on visual inspection we can see that the depth of cut skill limit is up to 65 mil okay that's the upper threshold value range okay so what we want to do is to set the depth of cut with the skill to about 12 mil which is the thickness of the hardwood plywood that we want to cut okay best practice would be to always add three mil to the depth of cut so that the blade can comfortably cut through the material so although we want to cut 12 mil on the hardwood plywood we will be adding three mil to the 12 mil which gives us 15 mil okay so that the saw blade can easily cut through the hardwood plywood okay and so here I will be reducing the maximum degree from 65 to about 15 degrees on the scale. And so this is what 15 degrees looks like. Initially it was 65 degrees and you can see that it's got too, too much clearance. So I'm going to reduce that to 15 degrees on the scale. And once it's 15 degrees on the scale, I will push down the lever down to lock in position. And so the cutting capacity for the blade at 90 degrees is 65 mil. And if you have the cutting angle to 45 degrees, it can only cut up to 45 mil. Suffice to say, if you set the depth of cut to 65 mil on the scale, it would provide a cutting capacity clearance of 65 mil below the base plate at 90 degrees. 45 mil on the scale will yield a cutting capacity clearance of 45 mil below the base plate and at 0 mil the cutting capacity below the base plate is significantly reduced and so basically we have set the depth of cut in line with the thickness of the hardwood plywood that we want to cut if you don't know the thickness of the material that you want to cut, you know, just set, you know, the blade beside the thickness of the material directly, just underneath the base plate, and then subsequently adjust the depth of cut scale accordingly. And once you have set the depth of cut you know just slightly beneath the thickness of the material push the lever down to lock the depth of cut into position 
before you proceed with this operation, make sure that you're wearing the appropriate safety glasses and approved face mask and ear protection. For health and safety reasons, you don't want damage to your hearing, you don't want respiratory issues or, you know, getting carcinogens into your respiratory tract. So protect your eyes from foreign object debris. Health and safety is very important. The next step of the process would be to carry out a risk assessment with regards to slip and trips. You know, where you've got, you know, one side of your vacuum connected and, you know, the other side where you've got you know, the circular saw connected, make sure that you've got enough clearance when you're moving. And you can also see that the vacuum hose is on the right. So halfway through the cot, you know, I'd have to adjust so that the vacuum hose doesn't get in the way. And here you can see the working tool or the circular saws um, connection point to prevent the movement of the rack when cutting and to allow, you know, for clearance when I'm done with the cot so that the circular saw can exit the end of the cot easily. I have wedged the rack with a chair against the door. You can wedge it with an object of your choice that provides, you know, impediment or, you know, movement of the um, rack when cutting. You don't have to do this. We're just improvising here, okay? Make sure that the good side of your plywood is facing downwards as, you know, the circular saw cuts in the upward stroke. And so it is more likely that you'd get the rougher bits on the underside or the bottom side as opposed to the top side. The next step of the process would be to cut in line with the markings on the underside. Set the base plate of the working tool on the underside of the plywood, you know, right at the lines of the markings. Get the saw blade spinning right before it engages the plywood whilst the base plate, you know, is sat flush on the underside of the plywood. Do not start the working tool right where the saw blade engages the, the wood. Always hold your saw firmly with both hands when operating. You need steady hands when trying to cut through the hardwood plywood. Your switch is locked off to prevent accidental starting. Your working tool has got a safety on and off switch. Firstly, depress the lock off button and then subsequently depress the on and off switch. After depressing the on and off switch, release your hands from the lock off button. You know, the switch is now on from here onwards. To switch off, just release your hands from the on and off switch. The blade may continue to rotate after switching up, so just wait until the tool comes to a complete stop before setting down the work tool. Ensure that the saw blade is not in the way of the cord or wire and that you're slightly offset you know, from the working tool when cutting through the plywood. The most probable root cause of why the saw blade has stalled or binded is because it has deviated from its line of cut or wavered during the cutting process. Suffice to say, cutting at an angle. Or it could be that, you know, the work tool was leaning on either side of the cut work pieces where we were trying to make diagonal cuts, thereby cutting binding. If this happens, do not pull the work tool, you know, from the wood piece. As earlier highlighted, just release your hands from the on and off switch. Like I said, you know, the blade may continue to rotate after switching off. Just pretty much wait until the tool comes to a complete halt or stop before setting down, okay? After which, you can reposition, you know, the working tool, you know, along its line of travel or linear travel okay ensuring that the blade doesn't rest on the wood and it's free spinning you know whilst you're trying to retrace its line of travel you can start at you know at the very initial position where you started making your diagonal cuts or you can start off you know at the position where the um, saw blade stalled you know but if you're experiencing difficulties you know from the stalled position you can start from the initial position and retrace your line of travel you know all the way through whilst making your diagonal cuts so i will replicate the process you know of cutting through your plywood when you're halfway through so here you can see that you know 
and providing enough room for the saw blade to spin, you know, prior to cutting, you know, halfway through um, the plywood. At this stage, I have ascertained that the blade isn't angled and, you know, it's free spinning. So I'll proceed, you know, to finish off, you know, the cut. As I am pretty confident that the saw blade would not be latching or cutting into the sandwiched sides of the hardwood plywood. Just make sure there's enough room and it's not picking on the sides of the plywood before you proceed um, to finish off, you know, your cut through the cut line. This is the first cut and you know it's not an entirely smooth fine quality cut but at least we know what our do and don'ts are. And please do note that other less probable kickback courses could result from overheating which causes the blade to warp, blade dullness and unguided cuts, sap build up in the blade and lastly incorrect blade height. So let's visually inspect, you know, the diagonal cuts to see if we've got, you know, fine quality cuts and straight off, you can see that, you know, it's not a very fine or pristine quality cut and, you know, there are a host of reasons why this, is, this has happened. Firstly, you can see that, you know, the blade bent at an angle, we kind of wiggled and, you know, it, we didn't accurately have a continuous cut, you know, it wasn't a linear cut and as such, you know, the blade binded in the sandwiched edges of the plywood. Secondly, the blade selection isn't spot on, okay? We have selected a ripping blade here, which is much suited for ripping applications as opposed to um, applications for veneers like your plywood. A combination or general purpose blade would have been more suited for your hardwood plywood as Cutting or making diagonal cuts on the plywood involves ripping and cross-cutting at the same time as you cut through its line of travel. Click on the link in the description or at an earlier part in the video where I kind of like discussed, you know, blade selection with respect to your hook angle, your bevel, the number of teeth, the tooth configuration and what blade is suited for what material, okay? The next step of the process would be to repeat and reproduce the process, replicate the process, um, not that we know exactly what we're doing to get, you know, finer quality cuts from the ripping blade. You know, a workman is only as good as his tools, you know, but we're just going to try and get, you know, good quality cuts from the ripping blade. But, you know, if, if we wanted optimal um, quality cuts, then, you know, your combination blade or your general purpose blade, you know, is the way to go as they are capable of producing the finer quality cuts that you see on the side of the hardwood plywood. So we are going to make more diagonal cuts but ensuring that you know our hands are sturdy, we're not deviating from the cut line or the line of cuts, you know, we're not wiggling, we're not you know putting pressure you know of the work tool onto the uh, material that's being supported by the poles um, of the rack whilst ensuring that our saw blade spins freely before it engages the hardwood plywood and if possible engineer a continuous cut So the next step of the process would be to replicate and run the saw blade through each subsequent work piece line of travel. And as you can see, this is a much better cut. So we're going to replicate the process again and cut this hardwood plywood into four pieces diagonally, you know, from both ends.
reclamp subsequently and replicate the process on the half cut plywood hardboard. <laughs> And like I said previously, make good use of your safety lock off button, okay, to prevent accidental starting. And when ready, press on the switch or the trigger. Make sure that, you know, the saw blade has enough room before it starts, you know, cutting through the wood. And, you know, cut linearly, continuously along its line of travel or along the, the pencil mark that you've, you've lined up on the hardwood plywood. The next step would be to rework the plywood hardwood piece where we had, you know, the binding or the kickback from the work tool. You know, just strip off, you know, the, the side to get a finer quality cut with the um, circular saw. And trust me, you know, this stripped off bit is not the best looking piece on camera, but it looks a lot better, you know, in person when you actually visually inspect, you know, the stripped off piece. And as you can see, you know, it's not the best looking quality cut, you know, aesthetically, but it's better off um, than the binded cut that we had previously. At best, the blade has just done a slightly below par of medium cross cutting and ripping you know, of the hardwood plywood. A combination or general purpose blade would have done a much better job with respect to getting quality cuts. Once done, place the working tool on its underside, you know, despite the fact that we've got a lower blade guard to protect the blade, you don't, you know, always want to be, you know, placing a working tool, you know, where you've got the blade because that could damage the blade accidentally, okay? You can store the coupling away or leave it installed on the vacuum adapter, okay, provided you haven't got the hose on it, that's fine. If you regularly use um, your circular saw, but if you don't, just store the coupling away um, on its own or as a standalone from, from the circular saw. Then subsequently, disassemble the coupling from the vacuum adapter by undoing them knots. And whilst undoing them knots, if the clips on the coupling, you know, disengage fully, you know, bring them quite close to each other and tuck tight in the screw and, you know, the clip should get back into position. Click on the link in the description for quality blade material and tooth configuration selection in order to get quality fine cuts as well as dust extraction, configuration or customization, how to use the power rail guide and risk assessment when using your secular saw. And that's about it really. If you found the information useful, don't forget to subscribe, like and share, help the channel grow and hopefully catch up with you later. Goodbye.